It is 2953 of the Third Age. Erebor has been reclaimed. Saron has fled from Mirkwood into Mordor to begin his pursuit for the One Dream. And the last meeting of the White Council has tasked Gildor and Glorian with assembling a fellowship to stop Umbarian pirates from assembling ancient artifacts from a Second Age prophecy. Join the players of this Adventures of Middle-Earth Dungeons & Dragons campaign as they unravel the mysteries of the prophecy. Welcome to Arda in part one of the Inglorian Bastards trilogy, Search for Tol Arasia. All right, welcome to episode nine of the Inglorian Bastards campaign. Uh, this is the first part of the trilogy, Search for Tol Arasia. And as I promised, every few episodes we would do an interview with one of the, I, I think I referred to them in, in episode five as uh, uh, like the f f famous characters or something, but you, I don't think you're, you guys are all that famous. Uh, but we uh, we have with us tonight uh, the person who we lovingly call Spriggs, who uh, plays Burn the Dwarf. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me on. Uh, so, so here, here's the way it's going to work. Where I have a, a few questions to ask you, and um, and feel free to ramble and and go off on any tangents you want. Uh, make comments as you as you see fit. But I guess the first thing I would ask you is, um, so we've we've played Dungeons and Dragons together probably for three or four years at this point, maybe even longer, um, and we've played mostly sort of vanilla. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, right? We've uh, we've played. I think that we've played in a setting called the used to be called in Fourth Edition the Points of Light set campaign setting, and yeah. um, most recently we played in um, where were we? Baldur's Gate, some somewhere over there. Yeah, it was like in that in that universe, I think. Yeah, so we were in Faerun uh, along the Sword Coast, um, and then we got the idea to to start this Lord of the Rings campaign. So I guess my first question to you would be. Um, what is your overall familiarity with Lord of the Rings and, um, what, what, what was it that excited you about playing in that world, if anything? Well, I mean, to start out, all I really knew was what I had seen in films. I had never sat down and, you know, read The Hobbit all the way through or the Lord of the Rings trilogy and like for you, like the Cimmeril or Cimmerillion. Yeah, um, yeah. So what excited me the most was... I knew that you had extensive knowledge <laughs> of Tolkien, so I knew playing in a campaign ran by you would be like living out Tolkien's story. Yeah, maybe a little too much sometimes, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's very lore-heavy, but that's what made it uh, fun to keep coming back every week because there was something hanging in the balance that we had to learn or um, something we needed to do to stop, you know, the bad guys. Yeah. So I, you know, I, um, so the, the campaign itself was a little different. Um, we, we had so you know, I, I didn't talk about it much, but, um, for anybody that that's played adventures in middle earth, they know that there are, there are, um, I think, I think Josh, one of the, one of the players referred to it as like all the sub rules that you have to learn, right. The, the embarkation roles and, the um, yeah, gosh, I don't even remember all of them at this point, but there, there are new skills like lore and shadow lore, um, and so, you know, we had to, we had to all kind of learn that stuff. Um, but in addition to all of that, you're right. I went a little, um, I, I did uh, sort of immerse myself in it. And, um, do you remember, do you remember the, uh, the quotes that I, that I used to send you guys? Yes. Like on a daily basis for weeks and weeks at a time. I'm pretty <laughs> sure we started playing this campaign like a year and a half ago and, we just recently finished it. <laughs> I mean, it feels like we were getting quotes before we ever even started yeah. about what was going to be coming and how the story was going to flow. So, yeah, it was cool to like get the quotes way in advance and then be completely confused for weeks at a time about it. And then when it finally came to fruition, we actually like learned what the quote was about and how it ties into our campaign. Yeah, yeah. So I have a few quotes for you tonight that I'll read. Uh, uh, at, towards the towards the end of the interview, but I guess um, let's go on to the next question. Um, so, how um, how did you decide when we were all sort of picking um, what they refer to as cultures um, in, in Adventures of Middle Earth uh, instead of races? So, I guess it'd be a class and a culture. Um, how, how did you decide that you wanted to play a 
uh, a dwarf slayer? Um, well, I, I, mean, I guess when I think dwarf slayer kind of comes hand in hand in my mind when it comes to Lord of the Rings, because um, you know my first connection to dwarves would be like Gimli and the Lord of the Rings movies, and like that's just kind of his personality and like the way he was in all the films. So that, that's kind of where I got that idea where I wanted to go. Um, but I always thought dwarves were just really fun to play. Even when we played in like fifth edition, I, I don't know. I just, I really liked playing the short bearded guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, feel, I feel like you can have more fun with the accent and, uh, I don't know, like their mentality and how they would respond to things. Their stubbornness. Just like, yeah, like just, you know, head on every time that you get into a fight. Well, it's, um, it's actually, it's amazing how many times um, your character stumbled across things that would, um, if you know, for people that are familiar with the books or the movies would, yeah, I mean, imagine, imagine Gimli encountering a big pool of water, right? With wearing all that armor. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and think about like, how, how many times your character encountered that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know that it wasn't in the podcast, but um, in that uh, the first episode that we did with me, you, and Josh, and the uh, the elf pulled me out of the water because I was drowning. Like it just it played along really well, and I feel like uh, having a character that you can build fears and um, kind of like weaknesses uh, is fun for the role playing part of the game. Yeah, so you you mentioned that that first. Um that first session we did together and, and I've referred to them in the first eight episodes. Now um, you, they've heard me talk about origin sessions. And again, I, we kind of stole that uh, term from, from the Marvel movies, right? But, but the origin mm-hmm. sessions, all the, all the origin sessions were, were um, uh, sessions where, where we could get to know the character. You could learn how to sort of play the character if we needed to tweak anything. And then we sort of built in your backstory and sort of, Olayed you to that, you know, that first scene, right, where most characters meet in a bar, um, you know, and they're just kind of thrown together for no particular reason or a reason that the DM has chosen. This was, right. I, I feel like, was a pretty organic process. And do you, do you actually, do you want to tell them a little bit about your origin session? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't remember it spot on, but I know that uh, how my character played into the story originally was that. Um, there was words sent that um, there was items being stolen from the like the elven communities, and Dane Ironfoot the second sent me to meet the man on the blue cloak. Yeah, but so after the meeting of the White Council, um, as word of the Umbarian pirates' uh, theft and coming up the coast spread through Middle Earth. Um, the the various wizards and elves uh, enlisted people and, and and were tasked with assembling of this fellowship. And you're right. Eventually, um, I, I actually told you guys that there was a blue wizard involved in this. And the and you know traditionally and historically, um, if you can say historically in the in, in the world of Tolkien, <laughs> um, the blue wizards were very far to the east and actually didn't enter the story at all except when in the, you know they were talking about how the Istari came into this world, uh, Kurumo and the various uh, wizard um, Maiar came into the world to sort of help uh, battle Sauron. Um, the blue wizards went far to the east, and I, th- I believe there's some lore about possibly cults rising up uh, based on the blue wizards. But um, I used uh, Al- Alatar, the blue wizard, um, who, like Gandalf, had to be essentially begged to, to come to Middle Earth as a wizard, um, uh, and so and so I, we used the blue wizard to sort of plant the seed into Dane um, to to say hey hey listen these these guys are sort of tracking right through Air, um, these these pirates are tracking right through uh, Area Door across the Misty Mountains and they are you know um, this is bad for everybody and then that's when Dane came to Burren. And then, and then sent Burn on, on sort of the mission. And that, that's, I think, where your origin session picked up. Is that right? Yeah. And then um, at some point, I met up with uh, Riken. And we traveled the road together. Um, where were we going? Rivendell? 
Yeah, so you had to, you guys had to go across the Misty Mountains, and then hijinks ensued, if you remember correctly. Yeah, there was a, was it a troll that we ran into, um, in like a cave. You actually ran into, I think, yeah, I think so. You, you ran into the goblins, right? And mm-hmm. and I think there was a troll involved, and then the goblin king was there, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's when we booked and left. Yeah, so so you guys, you you ended up saving Irime, who's who's actually was in episode one, I think. Uh, we met Irime. She was a sort of a high Noldoran elf that was heading um, to go across uh, to sail on one of the ships um, over to um, uh, you know to Amman. Um, and 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 you guys had we had referred to that with this this origin session we we had said hey Irime recognizes you know Riken and Burin and that's because Burin and Riken had saved them uh, saved her in the Misty Mountains right rescued her from the goblins so so you mentioned Gimli earlier and it's funny that you mentioned Gimli because um, in some of Tolkien's original writings um, before Gimli was ever a character Burin was was written as as the character of Gimli to to go to the uh the assembled council in, in Rivendell and to be believe it or not um Balin's son right and and yep. so do you, you want to talk a little bit about that or, or what your thoughts were for playing the the son of Balin I mean it's pretty legendary um I remember us like communicating back and forth talking about the character and building the backstory and trying to make it very token-esque and fit into the story. And we, I mean, even went far enough of, you know, building it into Tolkien, Tolkien's actual lore. And I thought that was really cool that it's kind of like a lost piece of lore that he has and, like, not many would know about it. So it was fun to kind of, I don't know, kind of, like, complete a story that wasn't written yeah. by Tolkien. And I think that's, that was really fun. Um but yeah, it was it was awesome, and the reveal was a lot of fun as well. You know, trying to keep it from people as long as I possibly could. So we um, we actually um, we, we um, people that are listening to this episode nine will have uh, kind of just gotten the reveal in episode seven, two episodes ago, uh, when they're, you're at the at the the door, sort of the large stone with the runes on it. And mm-hmm. you have to sort of rub your hand with the blood against the runes. And, and we really haven't revealed why that worked. Um, we alluded to it a little bit um, in episode seven, but um, haven't really, we, we really don't f- fully, even not now you know who Bal- uh, Burn's father was, you still really don't know who Burn is. And, and so that, you know, that is not actually revealed until the third part of the trilogy. Um, but, but yeah, so, um, so we find out a little bit about Burren. We find out um, that his that he is supposedly the son of Balin, and that his mother was a. Do you remember where she was from? Uh, she was a Firebeard. That's right. Um, I can't remember the origin. Yeah, she so. was. She was from the Blue Mountains. Blue Mountains. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It, it's been a while since we. I mean, it's been a year and a half since we've come up with this backstory. So it's it's been a while. I've entered in two things that if I were doing the campaign again, I would have changed. And, and, and the first being naming this, uh, episode, uh, episode, uh, episode eight, um, which is, which is going to be called for the podcast or is called the Fane of Durin. Fane of course means temple. Um, and, um, so I, I would, I would rename that from Heligrad to the Fane of Durin. Um, and the other, the other thing that you discover in episode eight is that there is this, there is this stone that looks very much like the Arkin stone that in the game we called uh, Durin stone. However, <laughs> there is there already is a Durin stone, right? It's down on the Miro Mir um, uh, next to Moria, right? Um, and uh, that's the big sort of obelisk that sticks up out of the water um, where where Durin originally had his first vision. Um, and so, so if I had to rename, I think, I think two of the largest mistakes that I made in this first part of the campaign was, uh, the naming of Helograd and the naming of the Durin stone. And they all happened to be in the same episode. <laughs> so I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, um, I, so I, I was wondering, do you remember, um, anything about the origin of the dwarves? Um, so, you know, where they came from, where they woke up. So the, they woke up in the, Blue Mountains, right? 
Well, they woke up. They definitely woke up in mountains, and and so my take on on this the stone that you found that I called the Duran stone in, in the episode um, that I referred to as a sister stone to the Arkan stone is what I said was that there are seven tribes of dwarves, and I I had envisioned them waking up in different parts of the world, and and Duran actually woke up in near the in the sort of Gundabad region. And um, I had envisioned that possibly one had awoken in the, in the, the lonely mountain where the Arkenstone was found. And so, and so, you know, I, uh, it was my belief. And, and in this campaign, I treated that every sort of birthplace or awakening place of, of each tribe of dwarf, the forefathers of each tribe of dwarves, there would be some sort of Arkenstone buried. Um, and so in, in episode eight, we find what I call the Durin stone, um, and you actually carried it with you through three campaigns. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it never, I, don't, I mean, at, at the time we didn't know, like, if we used it once, if it was just gone. So we were, like, holding on to it. And, we, you know, later on we learned more about it. But uh, we just, I, we held on to it as long as we possibly could without using it. Yeah, so we found out, you, you found out later that it did what? Uh, something very special, actually. Do you so, remember? So, um, if I remember correctly, didn't it, if someone died, the wielder of the Durnstone would reawake, and upon awakening, he would gain 70 HP back, uh, but then the, like, the life inside the stone would be consumed? Yeah, so... So yeah, so that so remember um, we referred to Teradon's wager quite a bit, and one of the points of Teradon's wager that these these Umbarian soldiers are trying to collect, they they had the thing that escaped the void, right? That, which was the sword, which you guys have recovered now in 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 the podcast. There is the um, that which burns inside of us all, and that is referred to Aya. Um, Aya is sort of the, the 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 life fire, the life force that is inside the earth. And, and I and I thought that was like the perfect thing to represent what what made the Durin stone fiery in color, and it has sort of this life spark that, um, as as you said, had a power to sort of reawaken you if you got injured uh, too badly. So yes, um, all right. So what else can I ask you? Let's see. I guess let's see. So we're. Um, We've traveled through across the uh, the Great Road to the Misty Mountains. We headed north, right? We ran into Naru Hell, your friend, um, the Red Maiden. Went um, had the battle at, at Tolis Garden, where where the sword was stolen. You you went across, uh, sort of up Eridor's End by the uh, Dowerhand Dwarves, crossed the Misty Mountains down into the Gundabad region and began um, tracking and following the, the Umbarian soldiers, and you actually bumped into them and were able to get the sword away from them. And then you ended up coming across Loni and Nali, which uh, were dwarves from Erebor. Um, and um, believe it or not, Loni and Nali are actually dwarves in Tolkien's writing as well. Um, they were listed among the dead in, uh, in Moria, if we remember, um, when the Fellowship travels into Moria, Kazakh Dune and they see all of the dead el- uh, dead dwarves, and, and Balin is listed there. But um, So L- Loni and Nali would be among those dead. But you bump into them when they're very much alive, and they're there looking for your father. Does this sound familiar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, them giving away my secret. Yes, they, they did. They gave they did the big reveal. Um, they, they said, you know, basically, if you weren't going to reveal it, they were going to reveal it. Um so yeah, so then and then you guys ended up going into the Fane of Durin, you finding this ancient temple to Durin, to the, to the birthplace of Durin, and and I invented something for this campaign called Durin's March, which was essentially uh, kind of almost like like a pilgrimage um, that dwarves did from the from the awakening point of Durin to where Durin had had the vision of him becoming king. Uh, down on the mirror mirror in the south Anduin Vale, sort of I guess it would be near so here you there. find yourselves in this in the fane of Durin um, with these traps and this big statue of, of Durin and um, you started to feel a little bit of dragon si- sickness right um, and you guys ended up sort of um, dis- dis- discovering how to shut off the traps and then you ended up with the Durin stone so I guess um, 
the next question I would ask you is, um, you know, up until episode eight, right? This is episode nine. What What's your favorite moment of the campaign so far? Um, oh, and, and if you don't, you know, if you can't answer that, then maybe um, what is the thing that the listeners can look forward to the most without giving too much away? Yeah, I think playing, like I said in the beginning, like playing along with the lore and you knowing so much about Tolkien and the writings, um, you know, it made it feel... Like you're playing, you know, a missing part of the movies that you never saw. I think that's what makes, like, um, you know, I, I've I've told people that, um, you know, I'm a historian uh, uh, that I'm that I'm a fake historian, right? Because I'm I'm studying, I'm I'm, I'm writing. Uh, I don't like to call what I write about Tolkien fan fiction. I, I say that I'm writing like fake historic fiction because, in some ways, there's so much history that you really do feel like you're. Um, discovering things that have happened in the past somewhere, and then and then you get to weave this beautiful story in between. I mean, that's that's one thing that Tolkien did so well is he left just enough. Uh, he gave you just enough to have your imagination go wild. You know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's just it was just really cool because I, I I knew playing the campaign that everything that you were doing followed an actual storyline, but. You know, we could all feel like a little bit of your twist on the story and like um, like creating Durant's march. Like, you know, it felt like that's something that Tolkien would have actually wrote about. Like it fits so well in the story. So it sounded um, plausible, right? I mean I, I thought that was right. Pretty, yeah. And like and like your take on the the Arkenstone and Durant Stone, like how those are created and they're, you know, like basically at the heart of the mountain where the doors were born. Yeah. Um yeah. I, I just like all those little things that you added into the story, they feel real because they make sense. Even just watching the movies and maybe reading a little bit of the, the novels, like it feels like that could be, you know, the missing pieces, like the things that were left out. Yeah. Um, but for future, something that I could tell the listeners that, I mean, the, it, the story only gets better. It only gets thicker. Um, and there's some amazing combat coming up fairly soon. I mean, I would say, what, probably 10 more episodes or so? Boy, yeah. I mean, so so the next place that the listeners are going to go is into the Withered Heath. And I do have a few quotes here for you. I promised you some quotes. So both of these are from The Hobbit. The first one comes from Thorin Oakenshield, where he referenced, They came from the Withered Heath, where the great dragons bred. Um, so we get a little preview of, of what Spriggs is talking about in some of the battles to come. I think I think the battle at the Withered Heath was one of the was one of the best early battles that we had. Um, and then there, this other quote comes from the Hobbit as well when they're in Bayorn's house, where uh, I believe it's a like a, a song or a dirge or a poem or of something. And this is a stanza. It says, "The wind was on the Withered Heath, but in the front stir no leaf." There shadows lay by night and day, and dark things silent crept beneath. So you get this sort of ominous feeling of 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 where the where the characters are going to be traveling. And these are some of the quotes that I sent them early on. They were probably like, "Why are you sending me these crazy <laughs> poems?" Yeah. Now, um, and I think the listeners should definitely pay attention to Riken's character because I think his by the end of, um, you know all three campaigns, he has probably one of the richest backgrounds at the end. Definitely one of the most tragic, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's... It, the, the character development uh, is amazing. Just just the changes that happen between like where you are now and where they end up. Um, same with Burn. I mean, there's still a lot of things that are to be learned about Burn. I mean, I feel like the Balin uh, bombshell was like big resonating moment but there's a lot more to come that's just the beginning <laughs> yeah, yeah there's a lot more so i mean yeah it, it'll be it'll be fun to listen in and uh relive this campaign as you release these episodes for myself well uh we really appreciate you coming on to talk and and hopefully this won't be the last time you come we'll uh maybe we'll hit you up again um in the, in later uh in this first part of the trilogy or even in the, the second part Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right. Take it easy. Though this marks the end of the episode, the road goes ever on. 
Until next time, join us at longwinded.one and consider giving us a review on Apple Music, Spotify, or really whichever platform you choose.